I'm going to start with the most basic. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move up to maybe not more complicated, but maybe different types of features that you can add into the workspace. So being transparent, it's going to take time for your students if they've never used workspace before. It's going to take time for them to learn the tool. So just like anything that isn't uh, a skill that they come to us with, we're going to have to scaffold that. And it is truly going to take time. But as we know, um, pulling right from that kindergarten program document, that our students are confident and capable learners. So we have to go with sort of that asset mindset and know that they can do this with, uh, with practice. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy, but we know that with repetition and with practice, uh, our students will be able to get there. And please know that the LT department is here for you every step of the way. Um, we know that this isn't easy, especially if this is your first time. So just know that we'll explain to you who your consultant is uh, and who you can reach out to when you have all of those questions. So we're gonna get started um, and just know that for today, we're just gonna try and focus on the things that we can control. So um, you may see lots of examples on Twitter of these workspaces that are very elaborate, um, which are wonderful, but workspaces can also be really, really simple and still incredibly effective. And I think that that's important for us to remember. Um, so I'm gonna show those examples uh, because I know, especially in the cohort that I'm talking to here today, that a lot of us have not used workspace and that's okay. Even coming from grade one and two, I did not use workspace definitely and not very effectively. So it wasn't until I started practicing and hearing really authentic examples of how it's used in those grades with students who uh, might not be able to read yet. Um, I have some tips and strategies for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get started by showing you how a student gets into a workspace. We get a lot of questions about that. So I thought that it was important to show this. Don't forget that this session is being recorded. And thank you, Bill, I forgot to hit record. So I saw that you did. The session is being recorded. So if at any point you feel overwhelmed or that this uh, is a little bit too much, I completely understand. You can mute me, you can get out of the live stream and you can watch this after the fact at your own time, right? So if at some point you see something and uh, you wanna try it out, feel free to mute me and go and try it on your own and then you can come back to the recording afterwards. I know that after a lot of days of hearing my voice, uh, you might not want to hear it for another hour, so it will not hurt my feelings, uh, whatever you decide to do. Okay, so here is the student portal. So when a student logs into a device on the portal, um, perfect, uh, go to the student portal, and then what the student is gonna do is they're going to hit APRA. So again, if you have a Chromebook, uh, a board Chromebook, when the student logs into the Chromebook, they're automatically taken to the portal. So immediately that's one step that doesn't have to be done. Then the student is going to click the HAPRA workspace icon. They're taken to this page. Now, most likely these primary students will not have seen another workspace. So it's not like they're gonna have a bunch of workspaces that they're gonna see. They're going to be seeing, um, probably one workspace. So if you think about a student, I put this picture here, you can choose a picture. And then for those students who have trouble or who can't read yet, you might be able to prompt them or guide them just by telling them what picture to look for. And then even if they click the picture, they can get into the workspace. So if you think about that, if this is a board Chromebook that they um, are logging into, that was one click on the portal, one click on the workspace. So two clicks and your student is into their workspace. So that is totally doable for littles with some practice. Now, of course, if you're part of the virtual academy, we don't know exactly what devices that they are going to have. Um, so we can talk about that a little bit later. And don't forget at the end of this session, we are doing a one hour Q&A on an actual Google Meet where you can participate with us. So if at any point you have some questions, Join us uh, at 10 o'clock and we can answer all of those questions. Okay, so your student has clicked twice and now your student is into the workspace that you've created. I'm gonna show you one that I've made and I'm gonna go through a bunch of different examples 
of things you might want to consider when making your workspace for littles. So for me, I like to use a lot of verbs for students to prompt them what they're going to do. So I try and keep it really simple language, language that I'm using in the classroom that's familiar to the students that maybe they're seeing. Um, if it's virtual academy, maybe it's in some of the documentation. I try and keep the language consistent. I use images wherever possible. And I always try uh, and include videos uh, for students who need that extra support because those are the ways that are gonna be really accessible. So for me, I made my workspace three columns. I chose not to use the fourth column um, just because for simplicity's sake. So the first column is our I can column. So this is where we, I can put goals, expectations, and this is the language that I use. My middle column, I did look. So these are all gonna be view only type of things, whether it be a video, a website, a link to something. This is just for the student to look at. And then the third column, which is uh, specially formatted, is going to be the do. So this is where the students are actually going to do work. So again, trying to keep it simple and consistent. Um, a lot of the questions we're getting is how can we do communication books? So I know that this is big uh, in the kindergarten program um, with the back and forth, uh, obviously agendas in grades one to three. So here's an example of something you could do. So this is an example of a communication book. It's a very simple Google Doc that I created as the teacher. And then if I open it, so remember this is the student workspace. It's a very simple back and forth. It's really just a Google Doc uh, and I'm going back and forth with the parent community that I'm working with. So this is me as the teacher writing in. And what's great about this, uh, French partners, ECE partners can also be shared on it uh, as well. So that communication can really be a team approach. So if you're thinking about ways to do a communication book, I'm now going to flip back to the teacher side of the workspace. So if I go here, here's the workspace again from the teacher perspective. So for me as the teacher, I put a card in the third column that was completely blank. So it looks like this, right? Very simple, it's a Google Doc. What I did then, because it's in that third column, as soon as the student goes to open it, it forces a copy. Meaning, my I don't have to make a copy of a communication book for every single student. Once the student gets onto the workspace and clicks that book, it makes a copy. Now for me as the teacher, if I need to go back and consistently update that communication book, all I have to do is go into my workspace as the teacher and look, I can see that one student has started their communication book, right? This could be Mariah, for example. I would have a list of all of my students here and if I click into it, I can then start to write um, anything that happened that day. So this is just a little strategy that you might want to start with, right? It's not an, a learning activity. Maybe you just want to start with a communication book, right? And this communication book is a blank Google Doc. But because you put it in that third column, when a student gets into the workspace and opens it, it automatically makes a copy. Then for you as the teacher, every day, if you want to get into that uh, communication book, you are here in your workspace, you click started and you can click into any student's communication book and write. So keeping it really simple again. So that's just one example of how you can use a workspace. And again, this might be a really nice thing to try the first couple of weeks, right? See how engaged your parents are online on the workspace um, and go from there. So that's one example. I'm now going to flip back to the student workspace. This is the student view of that workspace. So again, you can see that it looks a lot cleaner. So maybe when you're building in workspace as a teacher, it may look a little complicated and you're like, I don't think it's gonna be approachable or accessible for my students. Know that it looks different from the student view, right? It really cleans it up. And because I didn't put anything in that fourth column, I only see three columns on this student example. 
All right, so I talked about column headers and how to keep it really simple and make sure you're using the language that's consistent in the classroom. Then you can see over here that there are some section headers. So this can be used in a variety of different ways. For this one, I just put communication book, right? Again, I'm personally using emojis uh, to try and connect the students to the items. Um, but then you can also maybe break it down by like weeks, for example, week one, week two. Uh, I've seen some section headers that are actually specific dates. Um, you can also do headers that are subject specific. So you can use section headers however you see fit. We do recommend using them um, just because it really helps organize all of the information for not only the educators working with the workspace, but also the students and parents that have to support the student as well. So if we go down to week one, here is a really easy entry point um, if you want to use workspace. So this slide deck was sent to me by Katie Ryan and the kindergarten team at St. Isabel. So this is a slide deck of activities that they put together. So I'm going to click this and because it's in the look column, it means that it's view only. So if I click into it, Here is a slide deck. Now what this team did is that they um, uploaded every week activities in the four frames for kindergarten specifically with different activities inside. So why I like this strategy is that they did not have to go and update the workspace every single day or every single week. They only had to update the slide deck. So what's brilliant about that is, like I said, it's one thing that you have to update and it updates automatically into the workspace for the student. So as soon as you make an update to the slide deck, when the student goes in and clicks to open it, it's going to give them the most recent up-to-date version. So if you are new to workspace, this is a really, really great place to start is by creating either a Google Doc or a slide deck and of activities, right? And then the student can get into that slide deck and play around with some of the activities. So again, you're not having to go into the workspace every day and update it. You just need to update it in one place, which is the slide deck. The student, however, knows that everything that they need and the parent knows that everything that they need is in that workspace. So again, it's really clear communication. So if I look at this slide deck, they were putting links, right? Links to read alouds, YouTube videos, maybe links to um, some uh, really great learning tasks, lots of outdoor activities. Um, I think one of my favorite ones, let's see if I can find it. Create your own nature soup. So what was lovely about it is that, so a parent or the student could click the link and then it took them to an activity where the child was asked to go outside and make some nature soup, for example. So this was uh, the way that this team did it. You don't have to, but again, I think what's really great about it is that the slide deck was approachable for the team. Everybody was familiar with Google Slides, so it was really easy for that team to collaborate on that Google Slide Deck. Um, so that's really a benefit because it was a, a team approach. It wasn't just one person. And then within it too, parents could easily see the expectations that were sort of being met in the framework. Um, so again, just that extra communication piece as to what's going on in the classroom and that accountability, right? So even just some breathing songs, uh, maybe some experience, experiments, you can put whatever learning activity you want in that slide deck. You could even just put a math picture. You don't have to do all of this text, you could just do a math picture and say, think about it, talk about it, right? So maybe in those minutes that you are synchronous learning, the students could have the math picture there, um, or you could, and they could talk about it on your Google Meet together. So this is one example of how you can uh, really simply use a workspace uh, to put some learning activities for the students. All right. I'm gonna move on to another week. So this would be these two examples 
if you are looking uh, for a place to start, this is where I would start. So if you want to tune me out right now, totally fine, because I'm now going to scaffold upwards of different ideas that I've seen around the system that are working with our little friends. So again, maybe start with a communication book as well as a collaborative Google slide deck in that second column. If you put the slide deck in the third column, it's going to make a copy for all the students and you don't want that because when you update it, it wouldn't update their copy. So you gotta make sure that it's in that second column uh, and then you can use that slide deck to update as you go. And again, no fancy headers, no fancy titles, right? Yes, those are great. Um, and I'm gonna show you some really wonderful examples. But if you're new, don't get overwhelmed with seeing all of those. Keep it really simple, right? This is still pedagogically very effective and appropriate. So putting something like these two things in a workspace, you've nailed it. You've nailed it. So don't stress out about making it look pretty. I know that that's really hard, but right now we're gonna focus on the things that we can control. And these are two things that we can control and that are gonna lead to much more success for the school year. All right, so now moving on to week two, here's an example of a header image. So I've used these header images, uh, again, usually trying to keep it consistent with the language in the class, maybe that visual schedule that I have, maybe I'm replicating those pictures or the text on those um, routines, just to keep it consistent with the students. And obviously the images are a really great prompt. And I'm gonna show you some examples, right? So then the students are pairing words with text, uh, which also gives them a really good heads up as to what might be coming or what type of activity they could find. When, um, when we show you who your LT consultant is, if you're interested in learning how to make header images, you can let us know and we can send you some videos. But know that if you are new to Workspace, do not go down that road just yet right? Wait till you're comfortable with the actual functioning of workspace, then you can move into building header images because you actually have to make them. All right, moving down, maybe now you're ready to put a YouTube video on your workspace. Very exciting. So what's wonderful about workspace is that not only can you bring in things from your drive, but you can also paste some URL links into a card as well. So again, I used a header image to explain to students using you know, the verbs watch, that they are to watch this video. Uh, so the YouTube video can play right within a workspace. I just put a freeze dance video into this workspace. So the student can play it right within the workspace. They do have the option to make it bigger. Um, so that could be your next level. Once your students have accessed some learning activities, Maybe now you're ready for them to access some videos. So again, I'm gonna show you how to add these kinds of things to the workspace in the second half. Right now, I'm just showing examples of things you might want to put into a workspace that are accessible for our little friends. So YouTube videos are very accessible um, for our friends. Most of our friends, I would say, are comfortable pressing play. They kind of know those, uh, those icons. So another great way to get some new learning activities in there. All right, moving down to another section. Uh, so here's an example of where I've used header images to direct my students what they are to do first, next, and so on. So one and two, right? You can use numbers to guide students. Um, so right now I've put one. So for me to explain to my students, this is what they need to do first and this is what they need to do second. So using numbers, you don't have to use numbers in a header image. You could just type one into the title of the card to guide students. So again, keeping it really simple. So here, what I wanted my students to do is I wanted them to watch this video and then I wanted them to do this task. So again, this is the freeze dance video. Then the student would hit start once they are done that video, and hopefully it's gonna open up for me. How many times did you have to freeze? So again, very simple Google Doc, not flashy, not complicated. And the student could then type out the number on the keyboard. They could use voice note. 
um, a few different ways that they can show what they know. But again, a very simple task. So maybe this is how you want to approach it. Here's a video, and then here is a task to go along with it, right? One, two. See how many of your students engage with it. Um, see how it works. And then you can build from there, right? Maybe you can make a little bit more complicated of a, a learning activity. Maybe you can really get into some cool content areas. Um, maybe you want to put some science videos and have students explain their observations if you're more into the primary grades. Lots of different uh, opportunities to build up once you're comfortable with that kind of workflow. So that would be how you can continue to build. Then we're going to go down here. Now, again, please feel free to tune me out if you're already feeling overwhelmed and you don't want to hear my voice anymore or you want to get started because now we're really going to kick it up a notch. So this is maybe um, where you want to go next. So maybe you want to use Hair Deck and things like Screencastify. So here is an example of a learning task. I'm going to hit start. And it's going to take me into that activity. Now, what I did as the teacher to make it approachable for my students is that I put a link here to uh, a Screencastify video. So here's a video of me as the teacher explaining the exact task. Now, what I like about this idea is that I put that link right within the learning task. I didn't put it in a different column. I embedded it right within the Google Doc. So the benefits of doing that are one, the students don't have to navigate elsewhere. If they need to revisit the instructions, it's right within that same Google Doc, right? So they don't have to go back and forth and they can play it as many times as they need reinforcement wise to get the instructions, to understand the instructions and what's going on. So I used a tool called Screencastify, which everybody has on their account. And I highly recommend uh, you use that this year because I think it's gonna save you a lot of time and effort uh, and it's gonna work with all of the other tools that we have going on. So again, it's really nice if you're in that virtual academy for that connection from teacher to student, they get to see you. Like I said in some of the training videos, yes, you know, today I look okay because, you know, I knew I was going to be live with all of you, but it's okay if you're not, you know, perfectly and you're not feeling your best that day. Students just want to see you, right? They want to have that connection and build that uh, relationship. So try and, you know, bust out of that comfort zone and put that little box of you while you record so that student can um, really feel your presence, uh, even though you're not physically there. So I put that Screencastify video right within the Google Doc. So then the student can watch that video and then engage in the task. Now, what we are definitely recommending is using the Google suite of products as much as, as you can, right? We know that accessibility of those products is really good, meaning that it works with our read and write toolbar. So for our English language learners, um, our students who are on modified programs, our students who are on IEPs that have uh, legal, we have legal obligations to meet those accommodations, the read and write toolbar meets a lot of those accommodations right off the bat. So as soon as you put it into a Google Doc, you've already been able to meet a lot of those expectations. So that read and write toolbar is what's going to allow students to have the task read to them. Because I know a lot of the feedback that we get is, how are my students on earth supposed to engage in this workspace? Well, they can engage in the Google Doc, right? And that's where the training comes from. The workspace is really where the students will access everything. But in terms of the accessibility, that's going to come mostly from the Google Doc or Google Slides itself. So if you're new to workspace and if you're new to creating digital content for kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three, I would definitely start with Google Docs because it has the full read and write toolbar at the top so it can support students in listening to the text. They don't have to be able to decode every word on the page. They can have it read to them. You as the teacher, maybe you don't want them to use read and write. Maybe you want to read them the task. That's where Screencastify would come in. You can read the task to them and show them how to answer it, 
show them their options, um, et cetera. One thing I will show you right now is I'm gonna show you something called voice note. So also we know that some of our students might not be able to type out responses to um, learning activities. So how is it that you're gonna capture student thinking? One way is using Screencastify. All students have Screencastify accounts as well. So that's why I recommend you as the teacher use it because then you can demonstrate that skill for your students to share their thinking as well, which is really cool. Also, there's something called voice note housed within read and write. So what that is, is a student can just speak their thinking and it will actually capture that. So if I highlight a word, so this is the only little trick is that they need to make the word blue. If they go to voice note, if they hit the microphone, anything that I say, it's recording. So a student can share their thinking, their face is not visible if they're not comfortable, and they don't have to worry about it recording or spelling out the word that they're saying in case there are articulation challenges. This is just a recording of the audio. Hit stop, and then you can insert it. So then that goes into the Google Doc as an actual voice note. So when the teacher goes into the Google Doc, they can play back the student thinking. So that is a really great way to capture student thinking that is accessible. Again, so like I said, I as the teacher can now go into my student work, I can hit play, and I can hear their thinking. And like I said, I totally understand that this is not going to be intuitive. It will take time. So you have to get to know your students, figure out how you want to start this process. What's the most important thing for you to try first? Maybe it's simply logging in to a Chromebook, which we know can be painful, right? Kindergarten grade one do have QR codes using board Chromebooks. So virtual academy, we can have those conversations about uh, maybe some options there. But again, that is something that uh, you're gonna have to think about where you see yourself in this journey of distance learning uh, in terms of the digital content. Okay, so again, a Google Doc is a great place to start. Keep it really basic and simple. If you want, why not add in uh, a video recording of the instructions? But again, you can keep it at the basic level with nothing and have them use Read and Write to have it played to them. So, or you can build up and add those Screencastifies in there. So again, I used a header image to show my students what's gonna be expected. So they know that when they see this sort of picture, tell me, they know that they're going to have to tell me an answer to something or share their thinking in some way. So then they can sort of prepare. Down here is Pear Deck. So again, Pear Deck, I would say is definitely an advanced uh, thing. So you can create a Pear Deck and there's lots of videos on our YouTube channel on how to do that. And that's a really great way to get um, some student work, some student samples, especially with the drawing slides. It's a really nice way to capture thinking. You can do it live with your students um, or your students here can do it on their own. So I have taken a student paste Pear Deck and I've placed the link here for the students to click into. So I'm not gonna get too deep into Pear Deck because I don't wanna lose anyone. Oh, I don't know, it's one of those days, I'm very nervous. Um, it's gonna start for me. So here is draw what you did this weekend and the student can go in and draw their answer. So again, a really approachable type of task for our student uh, that might not be able to um, orally share their thinking or type out their thinking. This is a really great option to capture that, uh, that student using a tool called Pear Deck. So you can take Pear Deck links and you can put it in a workspace. Again, that might be something that you're gonna do way later on this year. I just wanna show you what's possible and what's accessible for our little friends. Then we're gonna go down to our last section. So here, I wanted to put a picture of myself for my students to know that here is an example of maybe my weekly goals. So I recorded a video 
and it's just me and it's just me talking about what we're going to do this week, right? So again, I did use Screencastify. It's a quick video, just me talking about what, uh, what our goals are gonna be this week. Maybe it's uh, a birthday of a student and I wanna give them a little shout out, right? Kind of like that community circle. I put that in that first column for them to uh, watch and sort of look at the goals. I have nothing in the second column, but the third column, I have a draw activity, a drawing activity, and a tell me activity. So if you've never used Google Jamboard, again, there are videos on the YouTube channel. You can open a Jamboard or you can put a link in there. How many ways can you make 10? So again, this is uh, accessible for students because they can draw their answers. And you can see their thinking that way, right? So it's accessible in that they can draw um, their thinking. So you can put those types of activities in there. And then here's a tell me activity. So if you are, uh, I believe the kindergarten math up program might be coming out uh, in the coming years, but I know that grades one to three have math up. You can take those activities because they are Google Docs and you can put them in that third column for the student to work on. So again, I didn't edit this document at all. I just took it from math up and I uploaded it into a card on my workspace. So you can take those sheets and put them into workspace. And then again, it's a one-stop shop for your parent, your student and yourself to access all of the content. So I'm going back to the workspace. I think I've covered a lot. I hope you don't feel overwhelmed because that was not our intention today. I just wanted to show you some examples of how you can make a workspace work with our little friends. So if you are new to this, I highly recommend just focusing on maybe creating some sort of communication. Um, and then as well as one resource, probably a slide deck, putting that as a link to view. And then your team can update that with activities as you go. There is no way for parents to really get a notification that there is something new. However, you can use something like School Messenger to say, uh, hey, our workspace has been updated, go check it out. So again, don't, don't feel the pressure to fill it with tons of different things, right? Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Don't get stressed with what you're seeing online and with others. We are only in control of what we can do, right? And like I said, these two cards here are very effective, right? So don't think that just because they don't look fancy that they're not, uh, they're not getting that like higher order thinking out of students or it's not meeting a certain criteria. It really is um, a really great way to use your workspace. Also, if you are comfortable with workspace and you're getting more comfortable and you're putting more things in the workspace, we always recommend that you build up, you don't build down. So what that means is when students log into their workspace, they shouldn't have to scroll and scroll and scroll all the way to week 15, right? Put week 15 right at the top of the workspace because I think that's gonna be um, more useful for students, right? Saves a lot of time and frustration. Keep all of your activities open-ended, right? So think about the questions that you would ask students in a classroom. Maybe those are some reflection questions that you can put on there. Um, totally doable in that. Only focus on the overalls, right? Don't get stressed about specific expectations. Focus on those overall goals. And know again that our students are confident and capable. So the more that we scaffold this, the more exposure, uh, continuous exposure that they have, the easier it's going to be as the year goes on, right? And you can imagine how powerful this is going to be if for some reason everybody has to work from home again, it will be seamless transition. You won't have to re-teach um, how to use workspace. You're already using that workflow to begin with. So we have about 20 minutes left. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back to the start on how to start 
a workspace. If you already know how to do that and maybe I got your brain going, maybe you can take this last 20 minutes to start building and then you can join us for the question and answers if you come across some stumbling blocks. So remember, if you are a student, it only takes three clicks and I'm gonna get out of everything. It takes three clicks for a student from the portal to get into a workspace. So here's the portal, they click once into HAPRA. You've told them to look for the blocks and they're in, right? So two clicks and they're in. All right, so now I'm gonna go right from the staff portal. And here we are. I'm gonna take a little bit of water. I'm gonna take a breath. Again, if you wanna tune out, totally your choice. I'm on the portal. I'm going to click workspace. And here I am, and I'm going to hit create. Now in those training videos, HAPRA did an update between when I recorded my video and this. So this is new. You're gonna be clicking create for students, and now you can give it a title. Now, if you're gonna be using workspace heavily, I don't recommend putting everything in the same workspace because that's gonna become overwhelming for students. What I would recommend is if you are using it a lot, think about the two subject areas that you're using it heavily with. Maybe it's math and language. So maybe you wanna make two workspaces for students. And like I said, they're not gonna see, there's not that many workspaces, especially K to three that the students are gonna be using. So those students do have the ability to differentiate between maybe a blocks and a car picture, right? So if you say we're gonna go to the car workspace, maybe that means it's a science workspace. So maybe you wanna create separate workspaces for different subject areas. Again, use your judgment. So maybe this is just gonna be a kinder, let's do grade two. Then you're gonna assign it to your class. Um, I'm just gonna have my training classes. You can create your own groups. You do not have to put a description. And here is where you can choose the cover image um, for your students. Ooh, that looks like a terrible worksheet. I'm not gonna choose that. Definitely the Rubik's Cube. All right, save. All right, so then again, you're using an image to prompt your students where to find the workspace, and then you hit save. So now here you are, here are the four columns. As you saw in my example, I did not use the fourth column. Um, I didn't need to put any assessment in there. I had my own system going on. So I just wanted to focus on three columns. So what I did is I changed the column titles. So this one was goals. And if you do wanna know a little bit about emojis uh, that I used, I simply right clicked, hit emoji, and then they all came up. So then I was able to choose um, an emoji to go. Of course, Santa is goals. Uh, I chose an emoji just to help prompt my students. So you can change any of the column headers. And then down below, uh, add a section. So this is where I told you some teachers were doing weeks, dates, subject areas, themes, months, whatever works for you and your team. Uh, you can title the section whatever you like. Lots of different breakdowns. I would put a section right away and don't build up here. Once you add a section, let's my say, oh, there goes my watch. let's say first, then I want you to start building down from there. Because when this goes to student view, you want it all to be under the headers. You don't really want to be putting anything above the headers. Uh, you want to be putting things down. So as you saw in the other videos, the plus sign is what you're going to use to add cards into the workspace. So hitting that plus sign, you've seen the other videos, so I don't want to go over it 100 different times. Um, you do have the option to upload from your computer, bring in from your drive, or link to something. I will say that if you're uploading something from your drive, it most likely is not gonna be accessible for students to do anything with, right? Like I said, the drive, your Google Drive is the most accessible format for our littles because of the read and write toolbar. 
So you want to be able to utilize that toolbar when the students access their content or their learning activities. That's what's going to provide the students the ability to have the task read to them over and over and over again, and the ability to share their thinking back to you so that you have that sort of assessment component. So we also recommend that if you do choose to share a slide deck, do not take this URL at the top and paste it here. Because what that's going to do is it's going to give editing access to the slide deck, which isn't what you want. If it's something from Google that you want uploaded into a card, always go through the drive icon because what that does is that it allows uh, all the permission settings to be done automatically. We got a lot of questions from March to June last year of my students are saying that they don't have access to the activity. Um, I, it's a Google Doc, I don't understand. What they did was they took the wrong URL and pasted it there. So if you do the drive, if you pull it in from the drive, that's going to be the safest way for you to make sure that it, it's going to work. The link is more for sort of outside programs like Pear Deck or Book Creator, Screencastifies. That's where you want to use the link icon. Um, also, Book Creator, uh, if you know about it, it's also a really, really powerful tool and highly accessible for littles. So you can also include those types of things in a workspace too. Again, not right away. Build up to that, right? I showed you where to start, and then you just know that once you get comfortable and once those kids are awesome and just rocking these workspaces and these learning activities, you can just have so much fun with this, right? But again, it's going to take time. It's going to take, I would say, months to get those kids comfortable consistently using it independently. But then once they get there, it's going to open up a whole new world of opportunities for our virtual academy students, um, as well as our students who are in the class. All right. So like I said, those three items, then you can hit done, and then you would have the card available there. Um, I did show you um, in the other workspace, the other reason why we really love using this tool is not only for convenience for students and parents, but what about us? Am I right? What about teachers? How is it convenient for me? Well, it's all housed in one space. So as the students start their work, meaning they open the work, they start working on it, you then as the teacher, only need to go to Workspace to see all of the student work. You do not need to go into Google Drive, into folders, into student folders. You don't need to do that because you can access all of the students' work in this one space as well. And you can provide feedback, right? Especially if it's one of those Google Suite tools, you can add those comments and that feedback right in. You can even use Screencastify to give your oral feedback to students. How cool is it when you have those conversations of assessment that you can actually fake have those conversations, right? So yes, you might not be able to do one-on-one -on -one all the time. That might not be a possibility, but you can totally record yourself as the teacher with the piece of work on your screen, the little box of you as the teacher in the corner, and you can talk about the work and have that conversation, right? So think about the power of that and that feedback, right? You're not just giving feedback at the end of a learning activity, you're giving it ongoing, right? Um, Alice Keeler always uses this thing called autopsy feedback, right? What's the point in taking all this time to give feedback at the very end when they don't have to use that feedback anymore, right? So she calls it autopsy feedback and that always stuck with me. So use this workspace for not only uh, parents and the ease of everything in one place, not only for the students in terms of ease of accessibility and also always navigating to the same place, but for yourself. You only need to navigate to one place to access all of the student work and to provide feedback to the students. So that's 950. I know that there's a lot of different things that we can talk about in terms of workspace, but I'm cognizant I don't want to um, push anyone too far. There is a Q&A that's happening at 10 o'clock um, that we can totally go over and you can ask me all the questions because I know I forgot a ton. 
I told Bill this morning, I was so nervous um, for this one. Um, I thought it would be getting easier at this point, but, but it's not. Um, and when your workspace is done and ready uh, to go, make sure that you hit publish. So your students can't see the workspace until you hit publish. So don't wait until you have filled it to the brim of a bunch of learning activities. If you put one thing in that workspace, you can hit publish. It's a live workspace. So as soon as you add a card, when the students go to log in, they'll see that card. They'll see the most up-to-date um, situation. So again, it's a working space, so you can publish it. Um, and then once you publish it, your students would then be able to see it. If you don't publish it, they won't be able to see the workspace. Um, I'm gonna go quickly here while uh, I think if I've missed anything. Here is, I'm biased, but your team extraordinaire from LT this year. Audra is on maternity leave with her gorgeous baby boy. So the amazing Tara Potter has kindly stepped in in a pretty hectic year. Um, so here is the team. So think about your family of uh, schools. This is who you can reach out to. Uh, and just know that this is overwhelming. And I know that there's a lot to take in. And if you've never used this tool, it's a lot. Um, we know that it's not the most user friendly for five year olds. Uh, but we know that this is the best tool for what we have to do this year. So reach out to us. We are here with you every step of the way. Um, email us anytime. Like we really want to help. Um, and if you have any amazing ideas, please tweet them out. Um, if you find a really great way to make it accessible for um, ESL, um, for our students with IEPs, um, for little friends who have yet to learn how to read, if you have some tips and tricks, tweet them out and we will make sure that we, we retweet them for sure, for sure, so that we can help spread uh, the knowledge and the learning because uh, we don't know everything. <laughs> Believe me, we absolutely do not know everything. So we rely on you so heavily to give us really great practical examples. All right, so I'm gonna leave this slide up here. Bill, feel free to hop on if I have missed anything. If you would like to join us for the Google Meet, um, as soon as we end this live stream, we're gonna go right into this Google Meet uh, to start answering some questions. But I'll give Bill the last word, just if I completely butchered this session for K to three, let me know. Catherine, you're too hard on yourself. You did a fantastic <laughs> job and so many practical examples. So I wanna, I wanna thank you uh, for, for taking the time and leading us on some examples and, and some examples from colleagues around the system, which is so, so important. I did put a couple down um, since you prompted me and there wasn't anything missed or butchered or anything like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so one, you mentioned math up and I just yeah. wanted to throw out about the uh, copyright piece, if you could ex expand on that when we are using Great that. Point. Great point. Oh, and thank you for bringing that up too. So um, with MathUp, you absolutely can use MathUp activities into the workspaces that you're creating. But keep in mind, you cannot make that workspace public. You can publish it to your students, but you can't make that workspace public because that's copyright information. So keep that in the back of your mind. So if someone's like, can you please share your workspace with me? Don't make it public. Um, there's other ways that we can go about doing that, but keep in mind copyright information. Um, yeah. Oh, and uh, sorry, and another thing, there is a bank of workspaces that are coming um, that are Ontario based. So, and that you can just copy or you can use as a source of inspiration. So in workspace itself, uh, if you go to workspace, and you go to the discover button at the top, there are lots of workspaces that have already been created that might hit your content area and grade level. Don't forget the social emotional learning workspaces that were created that you got to see in those PD days. You can take some of those learning activities, throw them right on your workspace. You don't even have to create it, it's done for you. So don't reinvent the wheel, take some tried and true tasks, put it in the workspace, and then work with your students on accessing those. All right, go for it, Bill. 
Um, you mentioned you, uh, you showed us a student view. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we had a sandbox, I think, that we were going into and showing. I'm just wondering, is there is there a view that we can look at when we're building a workspace from our, from our end? Is point? there a view? Yes, there is. So um, once you put your class into that workspace, and again, we can support you in that. This was more sort of the pedagogy side of workspace. Here on the left-hand side, so I hit that double chevron. And I hit the little triangle. Here are all of my students who are going to see this workspace. If I'd like to see the student view, I can hit the eyeball and I can get in to see how my student would see it. So again, in students and groups, you may have heard that you can group students and then assign cards to those groups. Again, that might be further on down the road on the journey. Um, but with those students in groups, maybe you want to see, OK, did I give student 10 on that modified program the right piece of work for him or her? Um, you can go ahead and hit that eyeball being like, OK, yes, they got the correct piece of work for their program. So, yeah, you would hit the eyeball to see student view. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. And one last one, and it might be a a q a session one as well because we're okay. trying to keep it basic on entry level but it would be if i have um a colleague that i wanted to collaborate in building a workspace how would i can i share this to build one up um, oh, great question yes so it is uh so a couple things we have found that bill's gonna come in to explain uh adding co-teachers in and the process to do that if you don't mind bill in a minute um yep. but in terms of we do not recommend two teachers on the same workspace with two different classes and the on the same workspace. So I know that it might be convenient in terms of, oh, like we all, we build the same content anyways, but one, you're gonna have to add double the cards for all of those activities and assign it to certain groups. But we are running into many roadblocks in the sense that if I create an assignment and I put in that third column, and my colleague takes that same card and sort of copies it or takes that activity, they're not the owner of that activity. So it creates a lot of problems um, in the end. So we recommend one group of students with whatever educators are attached to that. We just don't recommend two classes uh, and multiple educators. That's where we run into lots and lots of problems. So maybe you wanna create a, Google Drive folder that's shared, and then each teacher can put the work in there and then pull it and add it to their own workspace. And Bill, why don't you talk um, a little bit about adding co-teachers and support staff onto those workspaces? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Um, so one avenue is that some people like to make that master workspace, but what, we, what Catherine has mentioned is that you can make copies of it kind of like the resource bank that was just shown on the Hapara workspace area uh, under Discover. But for this, sometimes people start sharing multiple classes in one workspace once you collaborate with other teachers, and then that's where it gets messy. Mm -hmm. um, so on the left hand side, um, you can see teachers and uh, that's where, and we scroll down, it says add teacher. That's where you could, if you wanted to um, add a uh, co-teacher and that's where they would give editing privilege to that teacher to be able to collaborate on building a workspace. But we would definitely recommend again, just once you start using the workspace, not putting too many students in there, it gets big really fast. And if you do assign it, per student or as a whole group, then you're overlapping classes too. Mm -hmm. So just to be considerate of that, and I know we're kind of venturing a little bit away from the simplicity, but uh, we just wanted to give you a heads up that when you, if you need to share it with a colleague, um, you can enter it in this way. Um, I'm not gonna go too far into it, but I will give you a heads up that we have had requests for um, all colleagues to have access to um, Hapara workspace based on the virtual sort of pandemic learn at home, <laughs> Um, virtual academy piece and so we are looking into it so typically a classroom teacher with a class in power school would have access to workspace and their students only um, but we are looking at ways to be able to give access to support staff our colleagues our partners in education EAs ECs and so forth access to be able to be shared as a colleague on a workspace um, on that so just know that that information um, will be coming yeah because we totally, we we heard the feedback loud and clear that uh, 
We have some amazing uh, EA classroom teacher ECE duos and trios uh, that collaborate really well together and want to be on the same workspace working together. So HAPRA is working hard on that. Uh, and like Bill said, we will give you all information when that is up and running. Um, okay, Bill, are we good? You think? I am good. And okay. that was awesome. Perfect timing. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to leave this up for one more minute. If you would like to join us, and Bill, if you don't mind hopping, oh no, yeah, hopping over to that meet, I will join you there um, just so he can host with the most. Um, please join us at the Google Meet for any QA. Email your LT consultant. We are here to help you. We know that this isn't easy, um, and we just hope that we can bring some laughter and light uh, to these tech tools that can seem really daunting.